Thank you. What a beautiful tradition is to bring in the new year with such art and uh, inspiration and people uh, communicating with their inner being. This is called A Half of Century, please. Yeah. It's something that's as familiar to me as waking in the morning. The grasp of the hand on the neck, the microphone waiting for a voice, the restless expectant crowd, the plugging in in the first note. I check my tuning, close enough for rock and roll. <laughs> Tonight it's Hank's Saloon on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, not far from when I heard my first rock and roll songs as a preteen growing up in Flatbush. But pick any night in the past 50 years and it could be anywhere. The zoo, my collegiate band, at the student center taking a stab at Raga Rock after a set of Stax favorites. Lynn Cromwell sporting a garage protest moniker suitable for my debut as a recording artist at the Barbarian Club, singing that non-hit single, Crazy Like a Fox. A night at St. Mark's Church in February 1971, accompanying an Avon poet and simulating a car crash on my Melody Maker. With Jim Carroll, dodging stage divers, Within a studio, behind the board, listening to a record grow before my ears. The dank rock clubs in the formal concert halls and the sprawling festivals. And most of all, late night, when it's just me and the guitar alone together, trying to find a song that needs singing. I raise my glass to a golden jubilee I never expected, celebrating the 50th anniversary of my first show with the band. To mark the occasion, I've taken on a week-long assortment of random gigs that have come to me unbidden, without really trying to book a show or schedule some self-congratulatory after-party. I wanted to be playing, and almost without rhyme or reason, the week of my anniversary unfolded as these things do, better than I could have planned, kind of like my life in music. It was on November 7th, 1964, that I first took a pick to the strings of an electric guitar and sang to an audience, which at that moment consisted of drunk college students swimming in beer on the floor of Kai Sai fraternity at Rutgers. I was playing in a band called The Vandals. Bringing down the house with your kind of music was what it said on our blue purloy business card. And at that moment, we'd been working the two chords that comprise shout for 20 minutes. <laughs> Among our repertoire of Jerry Lee Lewis and the Kingsmen and Harlem Nocturne, we'd added a new song we'd heard on the radio so we could be the first on our circuit to play it. You Really Got Me by the Kinks. And then we segued into What Did I Say with the lyrics skewed to suit our target audience. See that girl from Trenton State? That's where they teach you to masturbate. <laughs> College humor, for which the word sophomoric was invented. Fitting, as I was a sophomore in college. We played four sets and split $100 between five guys. Some things never change. <laughs> I never thought I'd be playing music for the next half a century, or as I like to say, I would have learned to read music. But I did absorb the soundtrack of my time, using it to define who I could be, much like any other mutant teenager in the dawn of the mid-60s who saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Previously, the local bands in New Brunswick, New Jersey were mostly instrumental, modeled on Johnny and the Hurricanes or surfer combos from California. But the Beatles and their subsequent seismic shift in role model changed the game. I bought an electric guitar from a friend who'd only had a passing interest, and by the summer I was playing along. But who would have figured I'd be playing this long? I start lighting the anniversary candles at Hank's Saloon, which is more than appropriate because it's a down-home honky-tonk, just like I was promised when I began. Nothing fancy, a place to play loud and louder. It's a stopover on Booker Frank Wood's annual nine-day birthday party, a tour itinerary about as local as you can get, just the way I like my live music. Looking out at the colored lights, the reflected faces, Hearing the amp break up in back of me, I ride the dynamics of playing solo, adding the pleasure of a pickup rhythm section for You Really Got Me. Two nights later, I'm at Tom Clark's treehouse in the upstairs room of 2A on the Lower East Side. Tom and I go back a couple of decades and our shared reference points 
always erupt in simultaneously hollering when the regular show ends and the jamming begins. We like to call ourselves Tom Collins and Slim Beam. And so we salute our forebears, Lefty Frizzell, the Everly's bad finger, and Nick Lowe. He can always talk me into playing some Ricky Nelson, and I can always urge him to segue poor little fool into Coney Island Baby. We play far too long into the night, which is the indulgent point, until only a few hearty souls remain to see us try to remember more than the first verse and chorus of any song that's requested. It's only a couple of blocks and a day later over at Joe's Pub on Lafayette Street, but a world away in terms of venue and presentation. James Gavin has just written a heartfelt and lovingly detailed biography of Peggy Lee. Is that all there is? And for the book launch on Monday night, he's organized a tribute with many stars of the cabaret world. I've been invited to back up Tammy Faye Starlight, and as she sashays out into the audience for Big Spender, I twist my fingers to play the unfamiliar jazz chords. I know my solo must beguile, just like the ineffable Peggy herself. From the gal in the nightclub to the gals in the garage, which leads me to, on Thursday to the Bowery Electric to whoop it up with the cocktail slippers from Oslo. I leap at the chance to join them for the encore. The tune is Let's Spend the Night Together, a Rolling Stones song that I've never played, surprisingly enough, over 50 years. <laughs> we follow it with Eddie Cochran, Something Else. And for me, the very notion of something else has provided motivation on my journey as a musician. Keep playing. That's the way to do it. No rest for the weary or the hungover. The next morning I set out for the wilds of Milheim, Pennsylvania to headline the seventh annual Harry Smith Festival. Yeah. Smith was a 78 collector, living at the Chelsea, who curated one of the most important compilations of folk and related song in the late 1940s, single-handedly providing the hymnal for the mid-century folk revival that would provide an entire cast of characters centered around Bleecker and McDougall. I was too young to be involved in that scene, but its sense of tradition and heritage have always been close to my own philosophy of music making. Milheim is in the farmlands of Pennsylvania, midway across the Keystone State, and far enough off I-80 that it has the feel of a hidden Shangri-La. Amish buggies slow the pace of traffic. For an impromptu Saturday night show at the Elk Creek Cafe, I take on some modern folk songs. For your love, I want to be your dog. A medley of the box tops the letter into the velvet underground's run, run, run. And of course, Gloria. As we play, Amish teenagers gather outside to dance along. For the festival itself on Sunday, I choose to go even further back in time to some of the earliest recorded examples of Appalachian music. The songs put me in touch with the long heritage I am privileged to share and my own humble placement in the great tapestry of popular music as it unwinds through the past hundred or more years. There's down on the banks of the Ohio, West Virginia Gals, a romping version of Blind Willie Johnson's John the Revelator that brings out the latent hip-hop feel of early blues. Bing Crosby's Where the Blue of the Night. And to close out, will the circle be unbroken? Around and around I go. And here's to the next 50. Thank you.